time. It's time. Yay. Yay! Yay! It's recording. We're going. Yay! Thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We should we should disclaim it with how it's hot very, it is it's out like, here. It's like three hundred degrees outside. Yes. I'm like under the shirt. I am drenched with sweat. It's pretty. It's pretty embarrassing. I'm drenched with sweat on top of my shirt. Yeah, but we're doing it. We're we're doing a podcast in the heat in my van. And we're gonna roast it's a, it's marshmallows. A lot. Are we gonna roast marshmallows? Isn't that the thing? Well, it makes the it makes the van significantly hotter. What if we put it on the edge over here? I think I think that'll do. Okay. Um, I didn't I didn't plan for that, so I don't. I, don't... I did surprises. What? Oh wow! I got strawberry cream marshmallows. Vanilla bean marshmallows. Wow. And I got you extras because I didn't know how many oh, more of these hungry. you would be doing, so you could cool. offer your guests fancy oh, wow. marshmallows. Are these like gluten free or something? Or I have no idea. Um, we were gonna do. I was gonna do with Ahmed. Yeah, they're gluten free, corn free, non GMO, natural. I was gonna do with Ahmed, but he needs uh, uh, kosher marshmallows. Oh well, you should go back on the way back and then bring him some of these marshmallows. Yeah, I don't know if they're kosher, but. Okay. Yeah, I guess we can do it then. <laughs> yeah, I don't have no idea. I, I, I got you a gift as well. Oh, well, I have another gift for you. Oh, okay. Do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. Okay. Wait, close your eyes. Okay. This is really dumb. A dumb gift. <laughs> wow, it's a panda. <laughs> Oh, I was thinking of what to get you, and I figured that, like, the more compact that it is, the better. Yeah, yeah. And functional, and I figured, like, you would need a flashlight in your van. I normally just use my phone, but this is also a very cool gift. <laughs> I'm going to put this in my, uh, on the, um, rear, uh, rear view mirror as, as just, like, a hood, a, a hood ornament, or whatever you call it. Yeah, and then you can communicate at night. Yeah, yeah, like like with uh, Morse code. Morse code, yeah. yeah, yeah. You can signal to the windows over there, like, "Hey, Christine, I need to use the bathroom." <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to be here. So thank you. Cool. Well, I got you a silly pair of socks. Oh my gosh! Yes. Oh, Bobby's gonna be so jealous. Yeah. Our um, friend Bobby, which camera am I looking at? This one. This one, yeah. Our friend Bobby likes silly socks. And he's gonna be really jealous of me. They're frogs. frogs! I love frogs. I was debating between that and uh, uh, dog lovers' socks, and I, it seemed like these are perfect. Yeah. I love them so much. And green's my favorite color. I didn't know that. That wasn't planned. Thanks, Christian. Yeah, dude. This is so awesome. Absolutely. Thank you for the panda and the marshmallows. <laughs> Very kind of you. I'm excited. Okay. Well, we can bring. They break. said we won't want to share, so it's good that I got two bags. So delicious, you won't want to share. Um. And they're handmade to perfection. We'll be the judge of that. Nice. I doubt they're handmade, but if if ha Hammonds, I'm wrong about that. You can, and you're watching this, which I know you are. <laughs> um, you can contact me, and and I'll, I'll correct correct my. Uh, I mean. This is the number one podcast in the nation. Yeah, yeah, it is. I get 50 million downloads a second. That's a lot. Yeah. How long would it take you to reach the population of the Earth? Uh, like, less than a day, probably. Right? <laughs> Ooh, that's strong. Yeah. Um, okay, so we, we, we'll need a, a thing to put it out in case it gets too hot. So, oh, what should I get? Um, so I normally use a pan or something. Do you want me to get a pan? Um, do I think, well, there's there's one in that chest that you're sitting on. Oh. Unless, oh, dang, Ahmed stole my pan. Ahmed, I've never met you. Um, but you stole the do pan. You know what? <laughs> Here, do you want to do it? Sure, why not? My Snoop Dogg lighter. How do you... Okay, I know this is dumb, but I was never one of those kids who played with flat fire and I don't smoke, so... I probably shouldn't okay. point it wait, out wait, wait, myself. Wait. So it's like, where's the thing? Where's the thingy? You, you just hold it. Oh, it's right here. No, no, no. You just press it really hard. Oh, okay. I just wasn't pressing it hard enough. Yeah. 
My hands are all sweaty. They, ah, ooh, oh, okay, I got it. it. Cool, and then there should be skewers <laughs> on there to your, to your left. Ooh. Below the, the other millows. Ooh, oh. <laughs> funky millows. I don't think they made it in the heat. No. Sick. Cool. Very skewerful. Nice. There you go, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Um, well, I guess I've told you a little bit about what the <laughs> intention of this like podcast thing is. It's like not necessarily to talk about technique or anything. It's way more to talk about like the meaning of why you do anything in the first place. You know, it's like why would you like if you want to introduce yourself at all? Like, well, I, I guess yeah. Oh. Hello, I'm Christina Cornett, and I'm friends with Christian. And um, should I see what I do? Yeah. I am a concept artist. I work at Zenimax Online Studios. And disclaimer: nothing that I say is uh, is related. What is that? How does that disclaimer go? Um, nothing that I say reflects on the opinions of Zenimax Online Studios in any way, shape, or form. These are all my personal opinions. Yes. Nice. <laughs> um, well, and I guess it's like a so so. Your background is that you're you're a professional concept artist working in video games, and um, you've been obviously you know we've talked a lot about your past where it's like you've been working at it for a long time and you finally got it, and it's like um, I don't want to say it's not all it's cracked out to be like it's still awesome I'd imagine, but there are things about it that aren't necessarily like the best you know. Yeah, it's all. different for sure. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess it's like trying to talk about that experience of like, I know a lot of people who, um, would love to have your job, you know, working on games, making monsters and drawing for a living and stuff. But ultimately it's like, um, oh man, I'm excited. I hope this is good. Oh, they smell good. No. Never. What? I'm going to skewer it in the opposite side. Okay. That just died. Uh oh. No, did not last nearly as long as I thought it would. Is that one still going? Yeah. I, I think it's important that you're in the <laughs> shot since you're the guest. You're the star, though. But everyone can see me already. But they haven't seen you with your fancy new haircut. No. But they will. Oh, I feel like I need to entertain while Christian's gone. What? Oh, I was talking to the camera. To people watching. Nice. I feel like I know them already. Yeah, we're best friends. This is so new to me. Like, I know that. The interview? Or... Yeah, like the cameras and stuff. I mean, I know that it's something that you're used to, but it's it's very interesting to see your setup. Well, it's. I found that it's both like. Here, I'll, I'll say it into the mic so people can hear me better. Um. It, it's one of those things where it's like it's way simpler than I thought making something like this, you know? It's like I had all these roadblocks in my head where I thought that only like professionals could record a podcast or record something that somebody would be interested in. I mean, there's a lot of like little small things that can be kind of tedious, like camera batteries, obviously, and stuff, and mm -hmm. um, like audio syncing. But ultimately, it's one of those things where it's like it's way, way easier than I thought it would be. You know. Do you think that your time with Stan kind of prepped you for it? Oh, yeah, for sure. And it was less like him showing me how to do it. It was more just like watching him like be awkward behind the camera and then see that video release, you know, a month, two months later. And it'd be kind of like, I see all the awkward moments and I'm like, oh, God. And then I see <laughs> the actual final open. I'm like, oh, that's actually pretty cool. And, um, and I, I know for a fact that I'm going to be doing and saying things on this thing that are like embarrassing and I'm going to be wrong and I'm going to sound stupid sometimes, but it's like part of the process. And I, I'm pretty sure I couldn't be successful at this if I wasn't willing to be like kind of bad at it first. Yeah, I guess like, I guess accepting that when, when I was on for the, the draftsman podcast, um, which was super awesome. I was so awkward with some of the things that I said. Yeah. Um, but they did a good job editing it <laughs> to make yeah. me sound coherent. Well, and and I guess for anyone listening, it's like it, it's all movie magic. Like, if you're thinking about making a YouTube channel or trying to do your own thing or 
like write a book or any of that kind of stuff. A lot more has to do with it just like like being okay, being kind of incompetent and being okay, being embarrassed um, rather than uh, just like trying to, like I, my instinct was to wait until I had everything perfect, until I had all the cameras and all the equipment necessary and all the editing software. Mm -hmm. And I found that that was like uh, deterring me from actually, um, you know, doing anything. Um, and like, I, I think it's way more efficient to like fail on the job than to just like try to do a home run every time. And when do you feel like you accepted that about, cause I, I'm sure like the first one you started out with, you were like, I'm going to be, I'm going to try and make this perfect. But at some point you must've failed. And then you were like, eh, I'm just going to move on and well, deal with it. I think the failure wasn't necessarily a singular failure. I think it was like me trying and ha like half starting like a dozen times, you know, like me recording. I, I have like four or five videos of me painting and drawing and talking over the painting and drawing that I just never released because I just was too embarrassed. And I didn't, I, I think they're okay paintings, but I didn't really do a great job, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that if I um, like dedicated the time to just finish those things, I, they would have turned out okay. You know, they, they would have been fine. Um, like the, the failure was like not like being too afraid of failure, which is kind of ironic. I think I've let this, yeah. I mean, we've, we've been talking about that a lot. Oh gosh. I better eat this. Oh. Tastes like, um, vanilla milk, like, like vanilla ice cream. I don't know how I feel about it. I think I like it. It tastes like it's sugar-free, mm -hmm. you know, which is good, but it's like yeah. sugar-free in a, it tastes sugar-free kind of way. Ah! <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to, I'm going to keep that on. <laughs> I'm going to keep that in. <laughs> um, if I could ever get it off of me. Doing a napkin or something? Or... No. In the spirit of failing and nice. embarrassing myself. Cool. Hell yeah. Cheers. <laughs> nice. Um, well, and I, I don't know, it's like, we've been talking about this for the past, like, few days of just, like, um, every single creative endeavor, you know, that's really, like, worth anything, I think, is, like, it starts out with tons of failure. Like, when you were a student, you were telling me, it's like, you were totally okay just doing bad work, you know? Not, not, not bad work, but, like, work that wasn't, like, professional level, sellable quality, you know? Mm. And it was almost like a, a more enjoyable time in your career because you were less afraid of what it would be like. Well, like what essentially what other people were thinking of your of your artwork. Yeah, I definitely feel like when you're a student, like you have less, ex ex at least I did. I felt like I had less expectations of myself, um, not to like succeed or to, to go anywhere with my art. Like at the point at that time, it was like, become a, a professional in-house artist but I think like your expectations of um your art are more malleable I guess yeah. right um like you're so used to failing at least for me so used to failing at that point um that I was okay with it and I expected it and I planned for it a lot of times like I told you when I went to CTN I didn't expect to make any money like I probably lost way more money than yeah. I that I would right. have um if I hadn't done that but um I think you get used to like you I think you could get used to getting used to failing I think is better than yeah. the other side because like we've talked about people um not people but like generally people who are successful and they they succeed at something and then they have to keep on repeating that success or getting that same level of success or Right. or to continue and grow that. And um, if I imagine it would be harder to, f to fail if you were, if you were so used to succeeding in that way. Absolutely. Well, and I, I, I hear, I mean, there's that, there's that cliche. It's like youth is waste or youth is wasted on the young, you know, it's like, <laughs> um, oh, oh, what are you looking for? The strawberry flavor. Oh yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, But yeah, no, I think it's like a, um, like when you have a, like 
a partner you have to worry about. And... <laughs> I'll, I'll wait a second. I'm really trying. I'll do it I'm listening. Um, Sorry. The static of the sound of opening it messes with the. Oops. Uh, it's Sorry. A, no, it's a totally Sorry. Fine. Um, but, but, but it's like when you have um, responsibilities when you're older, whether you have kids or, you know, a significant other or something, it becomes like a, um, a consideration when you're trying to take risks. You know, it's like, am I going to be able to, um, you know, pay rent if I take this risky job? And if the answer is no, then you're way less likely to take it, you know, or feed my kids or any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, you think you can do it? Yeah. I think... Um, that definitely played a part for me for wanting to to get an industry job like it was past the point where you know I was doing freelance freelance but I was past the point where I could be on my parents health insurance yeah um so that kind of started me thinking about like the transition plus I wanted to work with other people yeah well and I, I think it's like a um it's one of those things where um, I don't think that working at a job is ideal, you know, working at like a corporation is ideal, but you get a ton of other benefits that like, it's almost like a compromise, you know, you get healthcare, you get paid pretty decently, you have a community of people that are around you, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, there are a lot of nice things about it that make it a really appealing option. And I'm not bashing the idea of getting, having those jobs. Um, and the dangerous side of all that stuff is it could be really, it can kind of get too comfortable after a while. Like, mm -hmm. let's say, you know, you have the skills right now, and I think you do, to make a really successful business, like something that might be worth millions of dollars, um, whether it's a TV show or a children's book or something. Um, uh, like, let's say you have the ability to make that happen in six months, and then you're at the job for forever, and you get kind of comfortable. You get, like, kind of used to not having to worry about health care or food or any of that kind of stuff, or rent. Um, and then people stay, you know, people stay and they, uh, like kind of compromise with what they want to do ultimately to, um, you know, keep the stable job. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's okay because, you know, and we've been talking about this, um, but I think that's okay because like, it depends on, like you said, your place in life. Like, do you have a family? Do you have kids? Do you, um, and also, like, do you have time for those things? And it kind of just depends on what you are. Like, there are some things that you want to prioritize and some things you have to prioritize. Yeah. Um, right. Well, I, and I, I guess when I say that kind of stuff, I sound like I'm bashing people who have these jobs. And I'm saying it's totally no, reasonable. No, you don't sound yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, if you're really comfortable in a job and you don't want to leave, you, should, you shouldn't leave. But um, I also think... Again, I guess what I'm trying to say is I think that there's, like, a compromise to it, you know. And, um, it's uh, it's one of those things that uh, I believe that, so, you know, people can idealize to a certain degree. Okay, totally fine. Um, it's, hard, it's hard not to because, like, you see all these artists that you admire. Like, when I was going to CTN and stuff, like... There were so many artists that I admired for their skill and their personalities and, you know, they were so down to earth and like nice and welcoming and, and that makes you want to be a part of them and, mm -hmm. um, work with them. Like, yeah. I remember like David Coleman, Patrick Ballesteros, like those were some of the, the standout names when I went to, um, these events that like, I really felt that they that they gave me the time of day as a student, you know? Right. And, um, I think because you admire those people, you want to be like them. Yeah. And so, and the, like a lot of them are working, um, in the industry and, and that's validating too. Yeah. like being able to work next to the people that you admire. Right. Um, and hopefully being somebody that someone else admires and that you can help in some way or, um, you know, be a part in their art education or art career ha as these people have been in mind, like, yeah. you know, Marshall and um, Phil and everybody like that. 
Marshall Vandruff and Phil Dimitriotis yes. at Fullerton College. Yes. <laughs> um, well, and I guess, um, you know, I, I really believe that uh, the reason people get into art is not for money. I mean, it's it's a, lo a lot of it is like wanting to um, like be like your heroes in a sense, which I totally understand. It's like wanting to be like Phil or wanting to be like uh, David Coleman or... Um, you know, wanting to work on Psychonauts or any of that kind of stuff. Like, mm -hmm. I totally, I think it's like a good place to go from. You know, it's a good place to, you know, to be at, and um, and it's it's really, uh, it can be a really satisfying thing to be working around people you really admire all the time, you know, mm -hmm. people you really look up to. Um, and I guess I, the thing that I'm surprised by is, like, it sounds like the best thing on the planet on paper, but I often hear people complaining about it, and it's a uh, yeah, there are sacrifices for sure. I mean, um, like as a student, you're sacrificing your sleep a lot of time, like uh, to get to that point. But uh, you know, as you keep going, there are other sacrifices. Like um, you, your art and your style is your voice, right. um, and you know, some people like that's a value to them to be in a certain style. Like a, like somebody who wants to really work at Disney, like they value that that style and they want to work there, and so they. Um, they put a lot of themselves into that. Um, but some people, you know, they have to change their style for work. Yeah. And um, you have to change your voice. And it's also not just that. Like, you're changing your voice in that you're not, a lot of times you're not directing the style or you're yeah. not um, you're not owning it. And right. someone else does. And someone else tells you what to do. And someone else, you're, you're making somebody else's vision and not your own. And if that's right. important to you to want to, to do those things, then you're sacrificing that. Yeah. You're also sacrificing, like, um, if you're going and being creative at work all day, if it's a project that you're not necessarily excited about, that might be something that you go home and, and you're like, oh, I'm energized to do my own stuff. But you might also go home and be tired and you use your creative brain all day on something else that's not yours. And yeah. um, and so you you don't spend it on your own things. And, yeah. and you know, I think people don't factor in life, too. Yeah. Well, and I, I feel like that's that's the downside of those jobs. Is people get tunnel vision. They get like too caught up on the idea of working as a concept. I know I did, you know, working just like focusing a hundred percent on just being a concept artist or just being an illustrator or just being or whatever. Mm -hmm. And ultimately it's like, you need time to like go for walks and you need time to like go and date and you need time to go and like, um, go surfing or go on hikes or play video games or something. And, um, the, like it, it really, I think it really has to become something that is your sole focus, you know, something that's a hundred like does take up 100% of your life at some point, you know? It does, and, and I don't know that it should necessarily, because, like, but I think a lot of people do. Like, we romanticize the grind, you yeah. know, and I know I did. Um, you know, I went and I worked for, I remember one one project, one class that I worked um, on, and I, you know, the teacher was great, and, and the projects were fun, and I worked for 12 hours a day on a student project. And I ended up injuring myself um, and I couldn't draw for like a year afterward yeah. without there being pain. And to this day, this was like six or seven years ago that this happened. I still have pain. Yeah. And that's because I romanticized the grind. Right. And these things take a toll on your health. And once you once you do that, a lot of times you can't go back. Yeah, yeah. When I, I feel like, the, you know, whenever students are, like, I'm getting to a point to where I'm giving advice to, like, younger students and stuff. And mm -hmm. my advice is always, like, you know, I always hear, like, I have two years to become a professional because I have this much money and my parents only gave me this amount of time. And mm -hmm. um, I think that that's dangerous because it's, like, you need way more than two years to become a professional. At least, like, you might be able to get the skills in two years, but to become, like, you know... Um, comfortable enough working that much and have like a life outside of art and all that kind of stuff it takes time to build and um i really like the advice that i give to students is like take your time like don't worry about it you know just mm -hmm. like don't give yourself two years like go work at starbucks or find a thing that pays the bills while you pursue this creative endeavor you know it's hard to hear that though as a student because you know 
you think like, I'm not afraid of hard work. I'm just going to, I'm going to push myself to do it. And that kind of work, work ethic is great. And don't, you know, lose that, that desire to like push yourself and be better. And, um, it was a really great breeze here. Nice. Just lean out a little bit. Oh, it feels so good. Don't, don't touch that by the way. It's going to be super hot. Okay. I won't. Um, oh crap. Where was I? Um, <laughs> something about hustle culture and like, don't push yourself and Oh yeah, I know. I think it's good to have, I think a, a steady work ethic, a being a hard worker is good. Um, but I think that if I didn't, I went to school for a really long time. Yeah. And I think if I didn't, I personally would not have evolved, um, my style as much because I'd be so focused on trying to get to a certain studio and getting a job and things that are all valuable if that is what you really want. Right. But, um, you said something in one of your other videos, um, that I think I mentioned to you that like, there's more to art than just becoming a concept artist or just a technical skill. Yeah. And, um, like technical skill will help you, you fuel the, the things that you want to do because you know like there's that whole if you want to break the rules you need to know them that kind of thing yeah um but there's there's more like like some of the best artists are inspired by life yeah and um like i used to write a lot and if i think th about the things that inspired me it was like emotion and passion and like the experiences that I had. And that was back then, like as a kid, like literally a kid when I didn't have any knowledge of the world. And I think right. the more knowledge of the world that you have, you're able to channel your artist's voice into something that is um, really evocative. Yeah. And I think that's what a lot of us are trying to do. We're trying to evoke something in someone else because um, we have been, we have been inspired by somebody who um, created something evocative or provocative. Right. Um, and I think a lot of what wanting to be a good artist is, is wanting to do that. Like there are people who have amazing technical skill and I admire that a lot. Um, and I also admire the person who has a lot of technical skill, but can tell a story in their art. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I'm talking a lot. Yeah, totally. No, I, I think it's great. <laughs> I mean, I, I totally agree. I mean, um, I, I equate technical skill to like you know, learning your punctuation. This was mine? Um, yeah. Yeah. Was it? Yeah. Mine's down here. Okay. <laughs> Sorry if um, I just drink your so totally. Um, but no, I, I, I equate technical skill to like punctuation. It's like, I can't define what an independent clause is. Like I can't define how to use a semicolon or a real colon. I know how to use a period pretty well, but maybe not, you know? And, uh, technical skill is no different where it's like it, it you're learning how to say something, not necessarily what to say. Mm -hmm. As I'm getting older and my art is becoming, like my art tastes are becoming more wide, my interests are way less about technical skill and more about the actual like content of what people are actually saying, mm -hmm. you know? Um, like I, I don't think it is necessarily that hard to become a technically good artist, but to make something that's like truly inspiring and truly like, you know, um, truly makes you like emotional and have like an emotional reaction. That's really amazing to do, you know? Yeah. Um, like I think that, I think that the, the technical skill is inspiring, um, to a lot of people, but there's also that extra element of the story. I mean, we admire, um, anatomy books, like of, you know, famous, famous anatomical artists, scholars, whatever you want to call them, like, yeah. um, Bombus and, yeah. and, um, Roche and, um, Goldfinger. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then there's somebody like Bridgman who like, he, he knows the punctuation, yeah. right. But he doesn't follow the sentence structure that is, um, not correct, but he, ex he plays with it, you know, like, yeah, well, I, that's something that a lot of people admire about his work. Well, and I, I know that you're really into children's books, you know. I, I feel like it's the same kind of thing where it's like Dr. Seuss plays with sentence structure, you know, both with the actual art that he's, that was created for the books and the actual, like, 
the content of the books themselves where it's like i watched um laura uh horton here's a who or mm-hmm. something um the other day the, the movie yeah and I, I was like okay so horton is an elephant and he's like a normal just everyday creature and then there's all these wacky you know like puffball kangaroo things going on and it's like <laughs> one step in reality and then one step in just complete nonsense you know and there's something about that it's like i think dr seuss is extremely sophisticated you know mm. and it's like more sophisticated than somebody potentially who has a doctorate in writing and is writing super complex thesis thesi theses on a you know i don't know how to uh interpret the row or something you know mm. Um, and it's strange. It's like something that's so so much like simpler can be can uh, cause people to have a much more like a much stronger emotional reaction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel the same way about Dr. Seuss. I mean, there was um, a book that I read a long time ago, so I might you know be talking out of my butt, but uh, it was the Butter Battle Book by Dr. Seuss, and um, my brother and I used to rent the movie all the time as kids but if i remember correctly it was um parallel a parallel to like the cold war yeah so he was drawing that he was telling that same story kind of and using his knowledge of of that um to illustrate how people can be so similar and yet different and do things they're doing the same thing like they're one is buttering their bread upside down yeah. and one is buttering it the other way but it's like the same end um yeah and their weapons get like bigger and bigger like right. like one makes like this walking weapon thing mechanical robot and then eventually they make this tiny little bean yeah this was a long time ago so i could be getting it wrong but i think that was supposed to be like the equivalent of you know a bomb yeah and um and those are those kind of books I admire a lot because they're they're using sophisticated ideas to give children a slice of what real life is. Yeah. Um, in a way that's not scary. Yeah, and, and not patronizing either. Mm-hmm. You know, it's something that they can actually understand and it makes sense to them. And I think it's like to be able to communicate to people that are young and don't have developed brains is like um again, it's like being a better technical writer doesn't make that job easier you know it actually might make it harder and um when it like circling back to the whole student thing it's like i feel like a lot of people are almost like waiting for permission to do art you know it's like i know i was it's like Mm -hmm. once i get the approval of these teachers or this job or these art directors or something then i can start painting then i can start doing art and i don't know it's just like a um, I really believe that you're an artist when you decide that you're an artist, mm-hmm. you know? I think it's a conscious choice, too. Yeah. And I don't think you're ever going to feel... Not you, but I no. think, like, people are never going to feel good enough. So, like, if you're waiting for... Like, I know that I went through a period of waiting for the opportunity to come, and it didn't. Um, like, some opportunities did, because, you know, I took part in classes, like... Yeah. That you set up that interview... Um, that, that talk with artists thingy yeah. and in that I like kind of talked about how I got started which was um, I went to a class and I busted my butt etc Patrick Ballesteros offered yeah. me a position but when it came to coming to a an in-house position like that didn't just like land in my lap you know yeah. um, and it took like you know what I I'm not going to not be yeah. an in-house concept artist anymore like yeah. i'm going to just reach out to everybody i knew yeah. um of like all the studios that i could find and whatever yeah. job was out there and and i think like in that way it's a conscious choice but also just deciding to d- be an artist yeah well and i think that there's a reality where you do have to be good you have to have some amount of skill and you have to like speak some amount of english to be able to to start um, but at the same time i think that no great artist becomes a great artist by just doing training, you know, by just doing figure drawing or just doing shape exercises or they, they become great artists by doing great art, you know? Um, and I, I feel like I was talking to Scott about this, where I believe that art education is somewhat of like a religious experience where people will like go from Russia or the Middle East or China or Europe, and they will almost take a pilgrimage from, where they're at to 
like Brainstorm or Art Center or the Watts Atelier, and they go and like talk to these people, like you know, like in, in the same. I, I I might be wrong in thinking this. If you if you think I'm an idiot, please comment and tell me <laughs> I'm an idiot for thinking this. But I think it's like a similar psychological thing when like people go to Mecca. You know, it's like uh, having faith that if I follow these steps laid out to me by these people, then I will become a great artist. You know, I will be my ideal in a sense, like you were saying before, you know, I think, I think that's true. And I think that's also like a wonderful thing in a way that these thing that these events have become so big and important and, um, inspiring as to reach out to, to people to come in and see them. Yeah. Um, I keep going. I'm fascinated by this. <laughs> I'm like, I, on one I recorded, I was completely out of focus for the entire time, so I'm oh, par no. paranoid about it. You could just, like, every time you talk, you could just insert a picture of your face. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think it's like a... Um, the artists that I really admire now are people that are, like, kind of crazy, you know, people that are, like people whose lives I actually wouldn't want for myself because they're so crazy and they're <laughs> sacrificing so much to like make their art good, you know? Well, they're living like a strong, uh, yeah. voice. I don't know how to, how to put it. They're well, they, they're, they're like, it. yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard to like live, like it's hard to be somebody who runs 20 miles a day, you know? That's a lot of time. Yeah. 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 And I, it's like some of the great artists that I see that I admire are like that where they like, have dedicated all of their energy to being a great artist and they've sacrificed tons of stuff just to like be able to do images that they're proud of, you know? And I think it's worth it for the people that do it. But at the same time, there's like a, um, they might not have kids or they might like not have a lot of free time or they might not have, not have a lot of money and, you know, or there's a ton of pressure on them to like continue to be good. And, um, it's like a, a strange, um, I, it's not strange. I understand why people do it, but um, I guess I'm saying I, I admire it. Yeah, I mean it's a sac it's a sacrifice and it's a choice and it's a hard. I feel like it's a hard one to make. Yeah, and I think like some people can stumble into it and it fits them, and and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I wonder if the audio picked that up. <laughs> Probably it was really loud. <laughs> if, we, if we didn't call attention to it, I don't think anyone would have noticed. But welcome to my intestinal functions. Yeah. World. If, if you didn't hear, she had a uh, a stomach grumble. It was very angry at me. Yeah. It was more questioning, actually. Yeah. It was like, "Pook, when are you gonna eat?" Oh well, yeah, marshmallows. I like the strawberry one actually. I do too. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I think that would be better in hot chocolate, though. I think so too. Yeah. Yeah. They look kind of like tofu, don't they? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not bad, but it's also like a regular marshmallow, so check it in. Oh, it is, yeah. Yeah. This definitely feels fancy. Yeah, it does. Um, how much was that bag? Like $40 or something? I don't know. <laughs> I didn't skimp out on you, Christian. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> Five, I don't know how much it was. $500 million. It probably wasn't that bad. Um, but I feel like you have to eat it with your pinky up. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. It, it, I mean, you're, you're um, like, it took you a long time to become a concept artist, right? Hey. Um, Sorry. There's a doggo next door. Nice. Um, to become an in-house concept artist, yeah. yeah. Um, and it took... It took a lot of failing, and it's funny because now I'm more afraid, afraid to fail than I used to be. Yeah. Because, I don't know, I haven't... I've been so fortunate in my job to come here, and um, that was, like, such a big success of, of my life, and, and I got to focus on other things, like going out, stuff that I didn't really do as much in, in college. Yeah. Like I got to focus on other things and, and, um, I miss the risk and I want to take that again. I want to yeah. take those risks again. Right. And 
And I kind of want to go back to children's books and, and talk about why I like them so much, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. Um, something that I love about children's books is, and I think Marshall actually pointed this out once, but it, I think it was Marshall. It could have, I don't know. Sorry if, if it wasn't you, Marshall, and sorry to whoever it was. But they, they said that children's books are so powerful because you can use any medium you want and you can use words or no words like yeah. you can use prose you can use poetry you can use just pictures you can use photography you can use um painting or i don't know you could probably make a, a children's book with like pop-up specs. books yeah yeah pop-up books um and and i love that um because it, it shows that there's no one way to get across a message and no one way to tell a story. <coughs> well, <coughs> you okay? Sorry, excuse me. The marshmallow was, the marshmallow nice. was too good. Yeah. <coughs> um, well, when I was watching Horton Hears Who, I was surprised by how sophist sophisticated it was. It's like um, he has this little universe that everyone wants to get rid of because it, they're afraid it's going to disrupt the like, status quo. And then they try to kill Horton and oh, all these people. And um, it's all about, like, when they realize what they're doing, they all stop. You know, when everyone, like, realizes that they're about to murder this civilization, they stop. And they go, they go and help them, you know. And I think it's like a, like a, 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 um, a statement about humanity as a whole, where it's like we get so into the us and them mentality that we will murder other people just to, just to be correct, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was in a children's book. It was in a Dr. Seuss book that came out, I don't know how, how old it was, like over, you know, probably close to 100 years or something. Um, and I, I think that those books specifically, and children's books specifically, can be a lot more freeing because you don't necessarily have to be as, um, like, the uh, level of writing or the level of, communication that you have to be at for adult stuff is way higher than um children's books so you're actually able to say less like if you're making a video game for adults it's probably more realistic it's probably you know kind of stereotyped characters like space marines or um you know king arthur type characters and um Whereas if you're making something for kids, it could be just like a giraffe with a really short neck and is purple, <laughs> you know. Um, and uh, you, you actually might have more creative freedom making stuff for kids, in a sense. Yeah. And that's not to like, and I know you're not saying this, but um, it's not to undermine like all of the... All of the, all of the sophistication it does take to make a book. Because like oh, children's, yeah. children's book dummies are a battle in themselves. Yeah. And, um, a children's book dummy. Did yeah. You explain that. Oh, I should. Um, so a children's book dummy is sort of like a prototype of the children's book. And you have like sketches and, um, yeah. layout of the pages. And, um, it's just a way for you to see the way that the book will look. Yeah. Um, but yeah, those are tough because when you see it, it's like, you start to think, do I want that on? Do I want this sentence to end on that page? Right. Because there's power in turning a page. Yeah. And that gets into a whole other thing about like digital pages right. and stuff like that. But, yeah. um, you start to consider those with a dummy. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Well, I, and I think it's like a, I, I, I think the act of making a children's book, it's not just about making a sequential story. It's about all the small things. It's like how it sits on a shelf and mm -hmm. you know what it's it's next to and what store it's in or um i guess like like there are tons of other small things that go into those kind of things that people would never expect you know and um i you know i, I guess the act of turning a page is like you know creating a new thought or like putting a, a period at the end of a, a sentence structure or a paragraph or something yeah um and um, I don't know. I, I think it's, uh, um, the thing that I've been curious about people is like, why do they value the thing that they value, you know? And 
Um, like why is it important to do plein air paintings or why is it important to try and start a big business or why is it important to like be a concept artist or a painter or any of that kind of stuff. And, um, when I ask you, like, what would you do if you had a billion dollars and didn't have to worry about money? The answer is like, you would do children's books, you know, and it's not like, and I'm not demeaning you when I say this, it's not like solve world hunger. It's not like, um, try and like go to Mars. It's not like try and solve Ebola. It's like to make children's books. You know? Yeah. I mean, I think I'd still want to work on games in some way. Yeah. Um, but I think if I was just having to, if I could only pick one thing and it happened to be that I ended up doing children's books for the rest of my life, like yeah. I'd be okay with that, yeah. you know, because there, there's variety there. Right. Um, but anyway, I don't think that was the point you were trying to make. Well, and I, I, but I think it's like a, you know, I think it's incredibly cool that, you know, if you had enough money to never worry about money ever again, like children's books would be a very important thing to you. You know, mm -hmm. and at that point, it's not about the money. It's about what the money can give. It's 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 about what like children's books gives to you. It's like actually something money can't buy because if you had a billion dollars, you would just buy it. You know, um, and um, you would probably get like you might find more meaning from being able to do the children's book, but it's, it it has nothing to do with the amount of money you have. It has everything to do with how you see. Like just getting, being able to do it, you know? Yeah. And I think that's the point that you were trying to make with like, people don't necessarily go into art for money. I yeah. mean, there is money in art, but you're more likely to not make as much money as like a doctor yeah. would. Right. Um, but there's something rewarding about it. Yeah. And it is like, for a lot of people, it's the telling of the story, you know, regardless of how you choose to do it, yeah. children's books or games or fine art, plein air paint, painting, maquettes, whatever. Right. Um, I think that that's one thing that artists could share in a lot of respects is that um, desire for telling yeah. that story or sharing something about themselves that right. um, it's a very personal thing. Like you're, you're, you're vulnerable and you're exposing yourself. Yeah. Um, and that's why like critique can be so scary sometimes. Yeah. Um, you're like you're standing naked in front of the classroom because that is right. your uh, for me it was like my my soul going up there you know well and i i remember i was uh, i was watching the simpsons and uh actually marshall talks about this episode it's bart gets an f yeah <laughs> yeah well it's like he goes and like you know he um he gets f's on all his tests and he's totally fine with it because he's not trying and then he puts all of his effort into studying and trying his best he actually stays up nights he skips recess he like you know doesn't play in the snow with his friends and he still gets an f you know he still fails and that blow of getting an f in spite of um uh trying his best he he breaks down during the episode and it's like a totally understandable reaction and it's mm -hmm. like both outcomes are the same if he tries or if he doesn't try. And it actually is like, um, you know, it, it, it's like if that, it, like I'm sure everyone has a thing in, in their life like that where they like don't try at it and they're like, oh, if I tried, I would be a success, but not really, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think art is the same way where I know in the past I've been like, oh, if I just tried really hard, I would just get really good at it and everyone would love me, you know. <laughs> Or everyone, I would get approval or I'd start to do good art. But that's not the case where even if you try really, really hard and you train every day and you become really confident in your skills, you still might fail. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think that's the, the scary part of being an artist. You know? Yeah, there's no guarantee. Um, and I know some amazing artists who, like part of their, their view of, su of success is having a social following yeah. or social media following. And their art is amazing but they don't have it. Whereas, um, they don't have like the following, whereas somebody who maybe not as technically trained, um, does. And it's interesting to see or to postulate why, yeah. why that is. Well, and I, I think, I think there's like a, a spiritual element to all that stuff where, um, like you could, the act of doing something and really trying at it and failing it is like, um, it, it can be a soul crushing process, you know, to authentically put in the effort for it and then not, you know, actually succeed is, 
Mm -hmm. um, like that's extremely discouraging. And I would say the thing that, that has made you successful or where other people haven't been as successful is it's like way less about your natural talent or any of that kind of stuff, but it's your ability to like stand in the face of failure and be okay with it and keep working. You know? Cause I'm sure you have a story where it's like, I mean, we've talked about some of them where it's like super embarrassing, humiliating moments where you tried really hard and no one resonated with your artwork. You know? mm -hmm. Of course, I guess CTN might be an example of that you know, for you. And, um, and looking back on it, I would say you probably you probably say it wasn't a waste of time, and it was prob probably pivotal, pivotal, pivotal to your development as a as an artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like I think people start when they start out, they have a lot to prove to themselves, like to their families. Yeah. Um, not everybody wants their kid to be an artist. Right. Um, and there's a lot at stake for trying. Yeah. Um, and I think with moments like CTN and for context for the yeah. viewers, like I went to CTN and, and I wasn't I'm not popular, you yeah. know, on social media and, um, I wasn't a, a concept artist yet yeah. and, um, nobody knew me. Um, and some people came up to me and, and liked my art and some people talked to me, but generally my stuff didn't sell and I knew yeah. that it wouldn't, but I still did it. And, um, I wouldn't trade that because I met a lot of people yeah. that inspired me and became like role models and, um, people were very kind and maybe that wasn't where I was meant to be or where I was destined to be. And maybe someday it will be, I don't know. Yeah. But, um, I think it's important to take opportunities when you can. Yeah. And, you know, opportunities for failure yeah. are ways that you grow the most, I right. think. Um, yeah, well, and I, I feel like that that's that's the thing is like it's it's never about how good you are. It's it's about how you can stand up in the face of like um, getting an F, you know, or being rejected by uh, a job that you would love to have, and moving forward in spite of that, and being okay with it authentically, and not being resentful, and not mm -hmm. like not like going and talking, saying bad things about the art director that told you your art wasn't good enough. And actually listening to them and actually following their advice and following up and, you know, and also like, um, doing it well, you know, and actually going and, um, like, I don't know where I'm going with that. Well, that's something that I'd love to talk about sometime. Yeah. Um, and if you have an interest or if people have an interest in, in seeing stuff like that, it's like networking and how... Sorry, my alarm went off. It always does this. Yep, 6.30. Um, like networking and like how to do it in a way that is authentic to yourself. Yeah. And um, that is something I'd like to talk about sometime. And, and oh, Do you want to talk about it now? Yeah, we can talk about it now. Well, it's it's part of the reason why I really admire you is because your artwork is so non... It's, it's non-conventional, you know? Oh, thanks. And I, I'm not saying that to like you know diminish you in any way i think it's really cool that you've been successful in spite of having something that's like a little bit less conventional than like map no, painting I, or something that's a huge compliment um and uh like I, I guess you want to talk about how you made that decision and why it's important to you to do what you do to like keep going in that direction yeah yeah to like to do something that's like you know is actually less mass market than doing map painting or something more realistic oh that's hard because I'd have to unpack it um, for myself, and maybe you could help me with that. Um, yeah. Well, I, I think we've talked about it a little bit before. You were like, you actually can't help what you value. You know, it's like if some, like again, part of the billion dollar question is like, you um, theoretically should value hunger or Ebola more than doing art. And I'm, I'm not saying I like I'm in the same boat. I would do the same thing. I'd probably still do art. Um, and. Like even when you have the freedom and choice to go and, and the ability to go and do some like great things, um, you would choose to do art instead, you know? And I was reading this, or I was listening to this lecture on just like 
like the muse, you know, the metaphor of the muse where the muse is like, uh, it's something, it's like a spirit that grasps onto you and then doesn't let go where it doesn't make sense to me why people would paint. It doesn't make sense to me why people would draw. It doesn't make sense to me why people would sculpt or anything from a, from like a purely logical point of view, because it's, it's less good for your survival than like going and hunting or going and like earning more money or, um, I don't know, like doing other things that are like literally more applicable to your life. And for some reason, art for you holds this really important thing in, in your values. I kind of picked up on something you said there, which is like survival. Yeah. Um, and we're lucky enough to live in a country where we can, we can survive. Um, and, you know, don't have to worry about, at least in our situations, don't have to worry about like running water and food to eat on the table. But yeah. I think that if your billion dollar question is to go around in a van and um, talk to people, yeah. like that's a form of survival for you. Yeah, definitely. Like that is what, that is the nourishment that your soul needs. Absolutely. And I, I mean, I feel like I am confronting dragons in my own life that are, I'm really scared of like talking to people in this way and like being in front of a camera and having my own show in a sense. And, um, the I get number one podcast. Well, number one podcast, number one podcast, <laughs> get you my podcast. Um, and then like feeling like I've already said things on this podcast that I'm like nervous about in terms of like sounding like an idiot or sounding like I didn't articulate it well enough or mm -hmm. sounding like I'm unprepared or tired or any of that kind of stuff. And, um, and doing it in spite of that is like, I don't know why I'm doing it and I just can't help it. And, mm -hmm. um, to not do it, I think would be kind of disappointing for me. Mm -hmm. I just wouldn't, I'd regret it. I'd regret not doing it. Yeah. And I love that um, about the spirit of somebody who wants to do crazy things. Like yeah. maybe going around in a van isn't crazy for you, but for a lot of people, it's like, you know, unimaginable. Um, and you give up a lot of things to do it. And like, I know that you admire that. And I think that that is one thing that is admirable about the artist spirit. Yeah. Um, is needing to create to survive. Yeah. But not necessarily on like a, a monetary level. Right. It's, you have to do it because you wouldn't live the way you want to. If you didn't. Absolutely. And I, I think it's like for me confronting the fact that like I have to do this, like this is our last day to record. And if we don't record today, then we probably won't record unless I come back through here, you know, and it's like a um, in spite of me not feeling 100 percent or mm -hmm. something else, it's like a it's still worth doing, you know, and going back to what I was saying about waiting for permission or waiting to be good enough. It's like, you can do something and say something and it be of, um, good enough value that somebody will get a lot out of it. You know, it might not be exactly what you expected, but it'll be something, you know, mm -hmm. and something is way better than nothing. And yeah. And I think that like, when you say stuff like that, it, it speaks to me about like, like you're making videos and yeah. like my making videos and you know even though I might not be as like technically advanced or um practice as like Steve is it Huston Houston 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 um maybe I have something to say that will resonate with somebody absolutely just yeah. like you go coming out in a van like you've inspired me yeah. and like I know that you've inspired other people and you know this is the number one podcast in the nation Ever. but you know yeah. if it if it wasn't yeah you know it if it didn't get like 50 million views every yeah. every hour um it still resonates with enough people that i think it is well, worth it to you absolutely well, it, the, and yourself it, like, it resonates with me right. and i've gotten like like 50 new subscribers and I, I have people that I don't know commenting on the podcast and it's like strange. Cause I'm like, what the heck? It's like, I did this thing that I thought no one would watch and you know, an entire classroom of people that I don't know have watched it, you know, and I sure some of my friends are in there, but also some of them aren't. And it's like a, if, you know, I suspect if I keep doing this, I actually will gain some amount of traction, whatever that means. You know, I don't know if it'll ever be, super duper big, but it doesn't matter if it is, you know, I think, and oh, I'm sorry. Well, and, and an important thing is, is it doesn't 
matter to me that it's ever big. And I think that contributes to to its potential to be something potentially Mm -hmm. bigger. I think there's something like the way you're approaching it is really genuine. And I think that speaks to a lot of people and, and also the content of what you're generating is like, you're sitting down with people that, um, a lot of people admire and people that others have never heard of that are admirable. Yeah. Um, and you're getting like a variety of human stories and it's hard, at least I, I found it hard to find genuine, um, interactions like that. Um, not just because like they're hard to watch yeah. because they're very real. Um, but because I don't always go looking for them. Right. Um, like I want to be diverted by, you know, some stupid Reddit thing, but right. I, I think that a lot of people and myself included, because I've started watching them, like the ones that you've sent me and, yeah. and um, I think it's nourishing. Yeah. Well, I, I think there's like a, I'm always being told to fake it until you make it, you know, which I think is bad advice because like my version of faking it till I make it might be going into debt for a, much nicer van or I, or I don't even do the van at all. I like, you know, just do it in Stan's studio and like have a podcast set up pre-built for me and then have all these other things. And it's like, um, you know, or, and, and start acting like, like I'm a big shot, amazing artist and I have tons of money and stuff. And like at this stage in my life, I can only afford this size van, you know, and I can only like use cameras that are hand-me-downs from other people. And, um, you know, I can only do so much. I can only say certain things because I just haven't like leveled up enough in a sense. So, um, and each thing that you do along the path is like a, it makes you more equipped to do the next thing. And eventually you get to a point to where you're scaling up in a way you would never expect. And um, like, like I, not necessarily fame or money or anything, but just some something will come of it that you would like, will be extremely grateful for, you know. And the point of that is like, if I were to be faking it until I make it, I might just give up, you know, I've burned the boats in a sense where I'm in the middle of Maryland, you know, I've driven like, I don't know, 5,000 miles to get here or something, you know, and slept in Walmart parking lots. And I've like stayed in tent cities and stuff. And, um, and that's like the best I can actually do, you know? I mean, it's pretty great on my end. Like, my friend came to see me, and I'm sitting with him eating marshmallows. Um, well, and I, I think it's like a, I, I don't want to sound like I'm tooting my horn. No, and horn. I don't think this is like, um, particularly amazing in the sense where it's not like groundbreaking stuff. But this is like something I could actually do. You know, it's not like I can, um, you know, put in a hundred thousand dollars into a really nice pod podcast setup. And I couldn't put a hundred thousand dollars into a nice van. I couldn't put a hundred thousand dollars into, you know, like taking us jet skiing or skydiving or doing crazy stuff. And, but I can drive out here and I can do these things. And I don't know if having all that extra money and all those funds and all that cool stuff would necessarily make it a more engaging thing. You know, Mm -hmm. Um, it might make it like higher production value, but it doesn't, like the like, I have to restart these cameras every like fifteen minutes because they have a they have a timer on them, and it's like annoying because like that's what I have to do. That I have no other option, you know. But I feel like to me it it, um, it makes the whole experience of recording this thing way more fun. It's like a um, it's not just about us being and recording a podcast. It's like the context of us being in a van and us like you know, um, on like a $50 folding table and, <laughs> um, mosquitoes are biting us. <laughs> oh, I hope not. Yeah. They probably are though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's a sketchy van podcast. Sketchy like, van. You couldn't do that if you were spending $50,000 to, you know, get a nice, really nice setup. Um, and I think, I think some people would like it in that, you know, there's, those YouTubers that are really big and they show their, their right. houses and stuff and people enjoy that. But I don't think it's relatable either for a lot of people. Well, I, 
this kind of setup is. Well, I, like imagine if like I start with this and then I actually build to something that was like really fucking cool, you know, and I have this like awesome van and stuff. And um, for me, it's like that that journey of like going from being in a cheap van to being something in something that's like a little bit more substantial would be a really satisfying thing to do, you know. Um, and I think that'd be more like a more authentic thing than just like starting out. And th that's actually more of what the whole journey of success is like. I think it's like you start out doing something that's really small and kind of sketchy and kind of like janky. Then it turns into like, um, like, it, I mean, you've always heard the stories of like, like Amazon started in a garage or something or uh, Cliff Bar was started by people just like making protein bars for their bike rides. And um, and then they turn into these things where it's like, you know what a Cliff Bar is, you know what Microsoft is, you know what Amazon is. And it started just like this, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not in any way saying my thing is gonna be as big as any of those things, but it's like a, um, like you never get anywhere without even trying, you know? Um, yeah, and like those are the things that we admire, you know, like, yeah. um, like if this became the number one podcast in the galaxy, you know, not just in the world. Yeah. Um, I think that people would feel more inspired by the fact that you started here. Yeah, well, and I, I guess I, like the only reason why I want to talk about this stuff specifically is like how is it, how it relates to other people. Where it's like if somebody is feeling like they aren't good enough or they don't have enough to actually say something, it's like um, you do and you are good enough. You know, um, there's so many like the thing that I tell people is like I hear all the time between teachers, it's like Stan has already taught figure drawing. Why should I try? Or you know, James Pake has already taught like. Uh, landscape concept art like why should I try like Kim jong Gi does perspective cool perspective like why should I try and I think just by the act of you doing it you would say things completely different than the teachers that you really admire where like if I were to teach figure drawing um, instead of Stan it would it would be from my perspective you know and my perspective values creative illustration and fantasy art way more than Stan's even though he likes that stuff his stuff is more fine art based um and I think that that, like, goes to the idea that the information is actually really accessible. And the job of a teacher is to inspire the student, not necessarily to present the information. And hmm. just by the I act... Like that take. Well, and just by the act of somebody going and, like, doing something that they think is, like, worthless, sure, it might be worthless, but it's more likely that your voice is completely different from the person that you're trying to emulate. And um, like I'm sure you like everyone has a phase where they're really into like JC Leindecker or something you know or Rockwell or mm -hmm. you know Sargent or any of like the famous great artists and but no one ever paints like them you know but they can learn a lot from them and it's just a place to go and um, like if you were to teach some kind of um, character design silhouette thing I think it would like sure there's a billion other people who've done it but not in your particular way you mm -hmm. know? i feel like you're speaking straight to my fears i well it, I, I think i'm speaking straight to my own fears mm -hmm. too because i'm really afraid of doing this stuff yeah, like, i'm I terrified it's a it's a very relatable problem yeah. because of that um like the fear of failing the fear of success the um imposter syndrome yeah and um like i want to make i want to make videos on silhouette and i started and unfortunately they got they didn't save whatever yeah, bummer. um but i could have recorded more yeah and um i think maybe somebody out there would would want to hear what i have to say yeah well and i, I think it's like a i think videos are the most applicable thing because i think they're just looking for like anyone can record a video but like the goal isn't necessarily with videos art videos specifically is not necessarily to reach um the you know 40 year old version of yourself or some the artist that you really admire it's to reach the 16 year old version of yourself that is kind of lost and 
would love to hear your opinion, you know? I wish I could just like, sometimes I just wish I could talk to people that, I, I know a lot of people do, but I wish that I could just talk to people who were feeling insecure about art and networking and yeah. um, failing and succeeding and all those things. And I know a lot of people put their voice into that and everyone has their own take. And But yeah, I don't necessarily want to I mean, the people who have are like 40 and have um, become, you know, concept artists or whatever, they've they've done their version of failing and, and now they might be doing other things that they have to fail at again. Yeah. Um, but the one that I can relate to the most is that, you know, the one starting off that maybe they didn't have all their family support yeah. or... Um, Maybe they weren't the best in the class, but they yeah. want to be better. Right. Um, and they're afraid. Yeah. And like, what if I don't make it? What if I yeah. don't make money? What if I don't get a job? And Right. Well, and I, and I think it's like a, um, that's part of the price of doing art professionally is that you need to, you need to live, you need to eat food. And if you have a certain standard of living, you need to get that standard of living, you know, or, or give it up, you know, and, um, it's part of the reason why I believe art is suffering is because you have to sacrifice things in order to be successful. And like, if it's not finance, if it's not like comfort stuff, it's your time, you know, or if it's not comfort stuff or your time, it's putting yourself in front of millions of people, you know, and it's always something, you know, and, um, the trick is, is like, no, knowing yourself well enough to know what's right for you. Like we were talking about this the, earlier today where it's like um, the right, there, there are no right and wrong decisions. It's like when you play the piano, there are 27 different keys that are right at the perfect time, you know, but if you play them randomly, it's not going to make a symphony. It's not going to make a beautiful piece of music. Um, and, um, but obviously there are like a trillion different songs that could be played on the piano. Um, and they are all different and they're all like you can have happy songs and sad songs and uh, grungy songs and punky songs and pop songs all just on the same instrument and, um, and the reason I'm saying that is mainly because it's like it's a tool that can be used to express what you actually want to be doing rather than uh, what you think people should be doing for you and somebody might dislike the thing that you're playing on the piano, but you might love it. Somebody else might really love it. And, mm. um, like, I think people would agree that Beethoven's symphonies are some of the greatest pieces of music ever written, but I don't know if those are on people's playlists, you know? <laughs> um, and it's, uh, it's interesting how there could be like the best song ever written that no one ever hears, you know? Um, or they just choose not to listen to, to it because it's not their taste necessarily. Um, and I think a big part of being successful is like identifying um, and being brave enough to say that the thing that you're really believing in is actually worth pursuing in spite of people telling you otherwise. Mm -hmm. And in spite of conventional wisdom. And I'm not saying anyone should go and quit their jobs or, you know, just like throw away their lives to become, to follow their dreams saying it's like if you feel like that's something you can do and be competent at and actually be successful at it then you should do that you know actually well you shouldn't but you should you know it's, um i don't want to be responsible for like <laughs> you know. um, it's hard to do though when you don't know the outcome yeah well and i feel like that's the hero's story is that you never know the outcome mm -hmm. you know it's like that's actually part of why that's part of the the reward that's why why people that take big risk get big reward is because you don't know what's going to happen you know mm -hmm. and it's a metaphor of like in archetypal stories the metaphor of like walking into a cave or walking into the woods it's like that's in every fairy tale or story about a hero ever it's like when luke skywalker walks into the cave uh, on yoda's planet i can't remember what it's called but um that's like an exact like exactly taken out of like a hero myth and, um or um, like you, you could go down the list of video games, like even modern 
characters that walk into the woods or go into a cave or any of that kind of stuff. I think that's a metaphor for just the unknown and doing things where, um, like if you were going to start making YouTube videos and doing all that kind of stuff, you're putting yourself in a position where people will watch them and judge you for it, you know, and that's scary. That's the unknown. And they also, they might really hate it and they also might really love it. You know, don't hate me. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Well, please don't. I'm not kidding about that. Um, um, but yeah. So, yeah. Do you have anything else you want to talk about? Well, I was just kind of listening to what you were saying. I get rambly sometimes. No, no, no. So. I, I enjoy it. Um, I end up going like stream of consciousness about what you're saying. And then yeah. at the end, like putting it into words is not as good at. at putting things into words sometimes. Yeah. Um. I, I think it, like the reason those stories are so important to people, like people will spend $10,000 going to Disneyland to take their family there. You know, people will like um, come from all over the world to, you know, um, go see like Robert Downey Jr. for a second at like a, a comic con or something and um it's it's strange because i think it's like those people represent in a sense like a like an ideal they represent like what god is supposed to represent and people will like decorate their rooms with pop figures and posters of art or artists or like swords and figures and all that kind of stuff and i think it's very i think it's very much a religious experience to do that you know and I mean, I, I mean, when I use the term religious, I don't mean like go to church. I don't mean like um, necessarily worshiping a God. I mean, worshiping something you're worshiping like an ideal in a sense, you know, so um, like I've done it. I've had cool art on my walls and I've had action figures and, um, and they're generally characters that fit into like the archetypes of the hero and, you know, the villain or, um, and, uh, yeah. So. Do you think that people should? Yeah. Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, I don't think people can help it. It's like it, again, it's strange to me going around the country and seeing how common like everyone knows about Game of Thrones. Everyone knows about Star Wars. Everyone knows about these things. And it's like when I drove around the country the last time, it was at the end of Game of Thrones. And all around the country, people were talking about how much they hated it, you know. And I thought that was such a strange cultural phenomenon to go from like city to city and see it real time of people like disappointed in this TV show, you know, this like from a, an objective point of view, this like flashing lights on a screen you know but people were invested in that way more than like maybe their grandparents you know or close friends of theirs or co-workers they were like more curious what would happen to Jon Snow than like what happens to real life people you know mm -hmm. and it's like um I, I think I really believe that that's like a religious thing I think it's like a people identify themselves with like I they want to be like Jon Snow or they want to be like Luke or they want to be like whatever and um the fact that Game of Thrones didn't live up to expectations was like um it was like failing the hero's journey in a sense you know it's like it didn't hmm. end realistically so yeah I think like like religion um being invested in those stories is really personal. Yeah. And um, we, when we start to, oh man, I'm starting to fade. I'm sorry. <laughs> I forgot my train of thought. Yeah. I feel terrible. Um, terrible about that. I feel good in general. Yeah. Nice. Um, we're on fire. Yes, we're on fire. Um, Come on with you. By the way, guys, we weren't joking when it's when we said it's hot. Yeah. It's like 98 out here. We're yeah. in an air-conditioned van. I'm normally more articulate <laughs> than this. But. 
You're more what? More articulate than this. I think we're doing a good job. You're doing a good job. Thank you. But um, but yeah, I think I think like those stories, like we relate to the art and to the artist um, in a way that like people have personal relationships with like the religion or their their yeah. god or. Um, well, and to me, it seems like you've dedicated your life, in a sense, to telling those stories. You know, it's like you spend your life creating characters that are like, you know, they have some really cool weapon or they have some like horrible defect, but it makes them stronger in the end. Or, you know, they, they have something of, like, and you'll be paid money to go and do that. You'll be paid money, like enough money to survive and live in a nice house in an expensive area. You know, it's like, um, what are you really doing when you're doing that? It's like, um, way more complicated than just like, that's a cool sword or that's, you know, cool gun, man. It's has a lot more to do with like, um, what does that gun represent? What does that character's hat represent? Like, mm -hmm. what is that? What is the story being told by making your character like, uh, at least on the games that you work on more, uh, masculine or feminine what's the story being told when you go and like paint things in a certain way and um and the answer is something you know there's something there's something there i think um it's like a everyone has the ability to draw but for some reason your drawings are valued higher than other people's drawings and i think it's because you're more in line with like telling the hero's journey and living it out yourself than, you know, people that might be, like, stagnant or stuck. I don't know, because I feel stagnant and stuck sometimes. Well, it, I feel like when you... Everyone feels stagnant and stuck because everyone has their own perspective. Everyone only has their own perspective. They, like, compare themselves to other people. But when you look at... Like, you moved from Southern California to a place where you don't know anybody in a job that you've never had before to, like, try and be successful. Like, you've, like faced a dragon in a sense something that's really scary to do and, um like you could have been fired it couldn't have worked out you know it's you could have just like got really homesick and you probably do get really homesick mm -hmm. and, um but in spite of all that stuff it's worth the struggle to continue to tell these stories and to you know pursue the hero's journey and all that kind of stuff and you could feel like you're stagnating but you're really not Like you've done a good job to uh, make your life something worth pursuing that is meaningful. Hmm. Um, and like I've been thinking a lot about this idea of vision, like being able to, like what you value determines what you see, and. If you value the opinions of other people, you're more likely to value things that make you feel insecure. And like when you walk down the street, what you value determines what you see in a, in a sense where like you look at the trees, do you look at the people, do you look at the food that you're passing, do you look at the dogs, do you look at, you know, what do you really pay attention to? Because there's so much happening around you at all times that there's actually you actually can't pay attention to everything, so you have to like narrow it down. And that's determined by what you value. And yeah, I mean, that's interesting too, because like part of artist training is going out and observing these things. Yeah. And like sometimes we feel the need to like scramble it down just the way that it was, but it's your interpretation of the world. Yeah. Um, like, you know, I could go out and see a guy sitting at a coffee shop and draw him exactly as he is. Yeah. Um, or I could see what I what I interpret yeah. interpret from him, um, and I think like when you start to see the world that way, because like a lot of what progress progression in art is is learning how to see the world differently. Yeah. And treating your treating your artist brain, um, and like over time you just start to see like. You know, he's got a wrinkle in his forehead right. because he's stressed. And that says something about him, right? Mm -hmm. About his character, right? But it's also what I've perceived in him. Yeah. Like, why did I pick that up versus the clothes he's wearing? Right. Like, 
you know, maybe he's dressed like a like a businessman. Well, and I think it again goes to the idea of like you don't have free will in the sense where you actually can't control what you value and you actually can't control what you see in a sense because you had no control over picking that thing, you know, and that might have been influenced by like your dad having a wrinkle or something or Mm -hmm. um, and it's like millions and millions of different things led up to you making that decision. I was talking to my friend Rembert about this where I think the value of art is like if it's true that what you value determines what you see and um, the act of doing art is creating the world that you want to see, you know, it's like, and practicing that and trying to communicate to people, this is the world that I see to, you know, these are the things that I value, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think it's an incredibly um, complicated and noble thing to pursue that thing. Cause it's like a, you're showing people if your values are something that you actually can and want to share. Um, you're sharing, in a sense, like you're the deepest part of yourself. You know, it's like if you only paint sexy ladies on Photoshop, it says a lot about your personality. Or if you only do oil painting studies of casts, or if you only do character thumbnails or sketchbook drawings, or you know images that are only ever posted to Instagram. I'm not saying any of these are bad. I'm just saying it's like, there's so many things that uh, communicate ideas than than just the image itself. And, um, in the same way that like, um, turning a book in a children's, turning a page in a children's book is like part of the art of children's books. It's like, way more complicated than just being a series of words and images consecutively. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and as you as you get not necessarily older but like more experience, you start to notice different things. Yeah. Like if I was a kid, I would have been so when I was a kid, I would have been so wrapped up like if I was an artist kid, yeah. right. like in the same doing concept art for whatever reason. Yeah. I wouldn't notice the same things that I do now. Well, I think it's because like you're more realistic and you're more like um, based in reality where you, it's like you actually have to compromise. Um, you know, I was talking to Brian Mark Taylor about this, the guy who made the Strata easel. Um, and it's a nice one. It is a nice easel. <laughs> it's very cool. But he was, we were talking about how children's art is is naive and in a sense it's better because it's like completely uninfluenced by anyone else. There's like that famous Picasso quote where it's like, it took me five years to paint like Rembrandt or Leonardo, but it took me my entire life to paint like a child, you know? Yeah. I love that. I think even as kids though, we're influenced by others, like, like super early stuff. I mean, a kid draws it, shows it to their parent and parents says oh this is beautiful let me put it on the fridge the kid is more likely to continue doing those things because of that positive reinforcement yeah well it's it's the same when we do like um instagram absolutely and it's easy to get locked into those things too because we want our art on the fridge right yeah well i I think that's a pretty brilliant metaphor for it it's like the the adult well the (laughs) adult version of putting your art on the fridge you know it's like i think that's so true in the sense where um, in a perfect world, we would just do art and not show anybody and just be completely personally validated by it. But that's not realistic because we're social creatures and we want people mm-hmm. to validate us. And it can be good, you know, it can be really positive, but at the same time, it could become like an addicting, like, I'm only doing this to get likes on Instagram, not even to make money, just to get likes. Yeah, there are, there are some artists where like, um, you see their growth over time and they're like very, very popular. And they still continue to evolve. Yeah. Um, and like, I find that I admire that more yeah. rather than, um, and like all power to them. I'm not saying there's, there's anything bad about this, but you know, for, for doing the same thing over and over again and you know, that's fine. Um, but again, it's like what you value. Like, yeah. do you, it, it's safer that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which isn't bad because I mean, Great, you're making money at doing something that you're good at. Able to pay the bills and stuff. But yeah. 
I, I think there's a deeper thing to where there's like there's more meaning to it than just having enough, you know, food to eat. You know, having enough tasty meals to eat. And um, I see this happen a lot where it's like people get addicted to just like having a nicer lifestyle. And the problem with that is like once you can eat exactly what you want to eat every night, and you drive the exact kind of car you want, you have the exact clothes you want, you have everything that you want, then you have nothing else you want. You know. Whereas like if you're pursuing something that's like of higher meaning than just getting every physical thing you want, then it never ends. You could do it for the rest of your life and feel totally okay with it. Mm -hmm. and, um, like if you have an end goal that's achievable for your artwork, then you can't do it for your entire life, you know? And, um, you know, I, I see a lot of people who are participating in art challenges or things online just to try and like get portfolio reviews or um be seen by the artists they admire that are judging contests or something like that um they're more worried about being noticed than the actual act of doing the art you know mm -hmm. and if they don't get noticed they get angry it's like oh i put in this work you know whereas like the reward wasn't necessarily the potential of being noticed it was the actual act of doing it mm -hmm. you know i think that Personally, I found that my best stuff comes when I do that, and not when I'm not when I'm thinking about the people that will see it and yeah. what they'll think of it. Right. Like I remember, I did some League of Legends concept art, back, yeah. not concept art, um, like a contest yeah. art, a long time ago, and I was so focused on it being good that it turned out bad. Yeah. And I was angry at myself. Right. And. Um, I think that's unhealthy and you don't find you, you, you don't find the things that you are good at trying yeah. to do something that everyone likes. Absolutely. And I think it's like a, um, I mean, I, I think I struggled with my own version of that where I was like just trying to be a concept artist and I really don't want to be a concept artist. I don't give a shit about map painting or character designs or photo bashing or any, and I'm not bashing anybody who does value that stuff just for me. Right. I don't care at all. You know, it's like going back to the values thing. The things that have influenced me have not led to me valuing that stuff. Mm -hmm. And to force myself to do it is like a compromise or like a trying to get approval of other people. And, um, and ultimately it's like a, a failure in a sense. It's me like giving into um, like evil. I don't know. It's like a giving up the best version of myself to potentially be somebody else that I know that isn't me. And, um, and it's really strange to see myself doing that. It, it's kind of scary, actually. It's like, um, I don't want to be doing this stuff, but I'm doing it anyways because I think it'll make me more validated, you know? Well, I think you've talked about, like, end goals. And, like, I know that you, they're coming at us. They're coming for us. Um, Skeeters. <laughs> there, you've talked about... Um, end goals and, and like how there really isn't an end goal because if you have an end goal like someday what if you reach that what else is there you know? yeah. um, and I think similarly like we've talked about people wanting to become like concept artists um, and that is their end goal Yeah. but that isn't you know once you become one there's a whole other plethora of problems and decisions and yeah. inspirations and, and like when I when I started working in-house my entire life changed mm -hmm. um, but I but I found new things to be you know unsettled with or right. unhappy with and there will always be something and there will always be new things that you want to do yeah well and it's strange it's like the super wealthy people I've talked to the people that are worth more money than they could ever spend they the problems don't go away they just shift they just change a little mm -hmm. bit you know it's like um you know maybe somebody's anxiety manifested themselves manifested itself as like overeating or not having enough food or you know not going to the doctor and like not going to the doctor doesn't get easier when you have lots of money in a sense where it's like um if you can if you have health if you have enough money to afford health care 
I mean, I, so this is assuming they give enough money to afford healthcare, you know. But if you are just getting by, going to the doctor is really, really difficult. Whereas if you have lots of money, maybe you actually just still don't go to the doctor to get something checked out. Mm. Um, and it's, again, it's such a strange thing. It's like people expect there to be this endpoint. It's like once I have um, enough money, I'm going to spend my life drinking mojitos on a beach eating nothing but pork belly and like, oh, I will have made it once I could just live on the beach in Hawaii. It's like, that's not true. You you become an alcoholic, you know, (laughs) you would die. Well, and and like going back to choice, like nothing ever happens that way unless you reinforce it. Yeah, definitely. And I I think it's like, for me, I think I'm going to look back at this time, even even if this thing doesn't become successful, it's like a really positive moment in my life where I'm like, doing something that's scary, doing something that's like really meaningful to me, doing something that's like, um, that I see is important, something that I can actually do, you know? And that's something that, it makes the potential victory a lot sweeter and it also makes um, the pressure of doing it way less. And um, because like, no matter what I do, it's gonna be success. Like in terms, like not successes in terms of financial or mm-hmm. fame. It's like a success in my own definition of like your values. Uh, my values, yeah. It's like I get to do this thing that I'm I'm scared of, and um, that I see is is pretty cool. Yeah, I think that's something that like it's easy to lose sight of when you're just starting on a journey yeah. for like a career or. Um, like traveling in a van or you know whatever whatever it is that you set out to do um, it's easy to lose sight of that because you it, you compare yourself to other people and yeah. um, when you do that your values um, in, in the moment not, they change even if it's not true to yourself well and I, I think it's like I don't judge people for like wanting money or wanting because I, I want money and mm-hmm. it's like it, I, I'm not saying I'm a perfect person, and I'm sure you would agree. It's like you're not perfect either. Yeah. Oh, I meant you. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not. Per- yeah. That's the right answer. Right enthusiasm. But, um, like, that's the beauty of the people that I know that are really successful. Is they know that they're stupid. They know that they're incompetent. <laughs> you know, whereas like a student doesn't necessarily know how dumb they are, and like I didn't. For sure. And I'm sure now you're yeah. like, I'm, I know for a fact I'm an idiot. You know, I know yeah. for a fact I'm a bad artist. And it's like, I, I know, I know I'm simultaneously an art artist that I admire and uh, not that good of a technical draftsman, you know? <laughs> and it's like, um, but it, it's like, I don't, I don't know. It's a complicated thing. It's a complicated question to, um, to, to, to answer for yourself. And it's also like a, um, uh, like admitting that you're bad is important because you're getting rid of your ego and your ego is a lot of the time hurts you more than it it can actually help you. Oh yeah. That was a big one for me. Like we've talked about, we've talked about ego and and I didn't really go into it too much, but um, do we have time? Yeah. yeah, Um, but like going into college, um, I didn't really understand the value of, of certain of certain things that are valuable to, to artist training. And um, one reason I value David Coleman as, a, as an inspiration in my art career is because one time I had the opportunity to um, be critiqued by him in a class. Yeah. And there were like four or five artists maybe that were, that were um, like elected to be like we were allowed to show him our work during him visiting us Mm -hmm. and mine was easily the worst portfolio Mm -hmm. there um and he he critiqued me in a kind way but you know I i was perceptive enough at the time to know that my art was bad yeah and i thought that it wasn't that bad yeah and that's when like the choice started to creep up 
like I would have to choose to be good at this. Yeah. I couldn't just keep on skating by and yeah. doing enough to doing like doing enough um, yeah. to get the assignment done or whatever. Right. Um, and like David Coleman was a big part of that for me um, and learning that I wanted it. Yeah. Not just because other people um, valued it because, you know, being in an art program, other people value success. And so you want to be successful to some extent because yeah. other people value it and that's what you're surrounding yourself with. Right. But you also have to make that choice because you value it. Yeah. And it, and it took a while to, to value it. And I, and I think I attribute a lot of that to like my teachers. Yeah. Um, like I had a teacher who was extremely patient with me and, um, I'm sure he saw that ego in me and yeah. you know I came back later and I said I, I really want to learn from you yeah and I took his class again and I did better and I and I learned from that experience right um but at some point you have to allow yourself to be I don't want to say broken in the sense that you you lose your self-esteem like yeah. that's not good um but allow yourself to know that you can be you know that saying like like once you break a vase that it will never be put back together the same again well i i mean it, it's like a in the hero's journey there's always like a dark moment of betrayal you know it's like when in, in like the lion king which i think is like a great example of this kind of stuff where mm -hmm. it's like simba is naive he like goes to the elephant graveyard just to spite his his father and then he ends up killing his father essentially because of that he's scar gives scar a chance to like push him into the you know into the cliff and gets trampled by all those wildebeests or whatever they were and, yeah and then he goes off and he goes off on his own and like he um goes and like hangs out with the boar and the mercat thing and he's like this essentially like a teenage boy where he's just like hanging around and eating bugs and not really doing anything and then um he uh I can't remember the female tiger. tiger. Nala. Nala comes and like tells him like you gotta like get your shit together because mm -hmm. Tiger or Scar is ruining everything. And then he's like, no, I don't want to. And then she shows him how competent he could be and kind of kills a part of him in a sense where he's like um, incompetent, you know. And he's like he can kind of look in the mirror and um, you know I think that that's applicable to everyone's life in the sense where. He goes and he confronts Scar and becomes king. And um, where you need to like confront the evil version of yourself that is arrogant and thinks that like um, if I was in charge, then everything would be great. You know, if I was like art, like every like even though you might be a bad artist, you might think that oh, they should give me. I'm I'm entitled to this. You know, mm -hmm. I've worked really hard, or my parents were really mean to me, or you know, society has hurt me in some way, so I should be given this thing. And um, and that's, I, I, like, I'm sorry if people feel that way, but I think it's also dangerous because, um, like, if you feel that way, no one's going to want to work with you and you're not going to be able to grow because people might be lying to you just to keep your opinion, just to, like, save your feelings. Mm -hmm. and, um, I, I've always heard the people that are most successful are the from you know people that teach at high-end art schools are the people that are more likely to listen to critique and not take it personally mm -hmm. uh, i found myself my i was really growing way more when i opened myself up to the possibility that other people might be more correct than i am yeah and that's that's a hard thing to do but at some point like once you once i broke that down and i listened to other people being you know, having input and having opinions. Um, at some point, again, I had to build myself back up and say, um, there are some things I'm willing to say that I'm right about. Yeah. And I don't mean like right or wrong in the sense like no something one. has to be drawn this way or right. else you're wrong. Right. It's more like... Right, we're right for you. Right. Somebody might give me a critique and say, you would do better drawing in this style Yeah. Um, and you would get a job better or easier if you did and right. you know do that and send your portfolio back to me um but there was at some point i had to look at it and say like i'm right for myself if i don't do that 
Yeah, yeah. When I feel like the hero's journey is like going through different phases of that, where it's like being a concept artist was a big enough goal for you to do that, but now it's like it might not feel as satisfying as like making a children's book. And then maybe eventually the children's book becomes like, oh, maybe it's not satisfying to do that. Maybe you want to make a TV show and a fe- like a feature length movie, and then and that grows from there. And it starts out with you being just like an incompetent like Simba type character when you're like a young person just doing art, you know? Well, Phoenix has to die before it's reborn yeah, well, from the flame. But, but it's like, it's so, <laughs> it's so complicated. It's like, I, I think that's the reason those stories resonate with people so much is because it's like applicable to their own lives. You know, mm-hmm. it's like everyone has a version of like, like professor Snape in their own life, you know, or whether it's, it's not a physical person, it's themselves and they treat themselves really harshly, you know? Um, and they have like a Dumbledore where it's like Marshall Vandruff is your Dumbledore, you know? I was going to say Marshall. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the person that's like showing you the way, but you know, is also not completely perfect himself. And he's just like, the only difference is he's further along the path than you are. You know? and, um, he's a wise man. and that wisdom comes from just like following the path, you know, and, um, every king or every queen or every person that's like become a fully realized person in a sense no one's ever fully realized but everyone that's more realized than other people they have like um confronted those demons in a way that like um like simba in the lion king is supposed to go to the elephant graveyard you know and that's like the metaphor of people like going to school you know it's like if you go to middle school you're going to be picked on and you're going to be pushed around and stuff and it's like the wrong thing isn't to like be picked on or anything because that's going to happen no matter what the way you react to it determines if it's right or wrong you know Mm -hmm. and um like you coming to maryland is like you doing a version of going into the elephant graveyard where it's like scary and bad stuff happens and things that you don't want to talk about those things don't happen in school you know those things don't happen in a safe space um but they're worth confronting because they like make you more competent make you more like um more willing to like uh, be the person that you know you could be you know yeah putting yourself out there and um going into the elephant graveyard um is the way that you grow and realize that it's a value to you yeah um well, I, I think it's scary it, and it's really scary and I think it's like um, the thing that determines somebody's success is how much responsibility they're willing to take on and actually meaningfully take on you know it's like um, if you tried to start like a 50 million dollar children's book business you actually might be successful at it you know but that's a lot of responsibility and it's like do you want that amount of responsibility the answer might be no but mm-hmm. there might be something there that you might be like completely like if you were there now you'd be like that was absolutely the right decision you know um but like it, it's always difficult to go into a scary place it's always difficult to walk into the cave it's always difficult to like look where you don't want to look and what do you think that it what do you think the scary cave is for students um i think it's like um maybe the outcome that they want is not the outcome that will make them happy you know or content Mm -hmm. it's like maybe being a concept artist won't actually do anything for your life or or maybe doing art is not the thing you're supposed to do you know or that you won't make it in a way that you think yeah exactly and it's like confronting that reality that you're not you know the person that's supposed to be an art director or a concept artist or um, like maybe you're supposed to be the person that mops the floors and maybe that makes you really ashamed of who you are but there's no shame in being a janitor there's no shame in being a plumber or an electrician or you know and I think the trouble comes in is when people start to like um, see themselves in their current station and they're like I'm a loser you know I'm a, I'm a failure and that's and i think that's everyone's elephant graveyard is like maybe the thing that i'm doing is not the thing i'm supposed to be doing mm-hmm. 
Um, I think, like, being able to, like, evolve and go with the flow in some respects is valuable because, like, when I think about it, I went to CTN because I wanted to be in the animation yeah. um, industry. And it turned out that at the time, at least, um, and up till now, yeah. that was not what I was meant yeah. to do. Um, and, at, I mean, at least currently, like, maybe it will change, but... Yeah. Um, once I accepted that there were other possibilities, and for me it was games, um, and that came from like joining a Google Hangout full of 3D artists yeah. who were doing art for games or aspiring to do art for games, and yeah. they said, hey, let's go to GDC, and I did, and then I decided like there might not be room for me right now in yeah. animation, but there might be room for games, and I think like sometimes we become so have such a tunnel vision on what we want that we miss what we are meant to do yeah absolutely and i, I think it's like it takes um like i i think you know my definition of god is a lot more nebulous than the traditional definition of god but it's like when god puts that in front of you it's like he's like everything in front of you that could change your life is actually right in front of you and it's just your ability to see it is the thing that's limiting you or mm -hmm. And it's, um, like, in your ability to accept those opportunities when they come up. And, um, and it's scary to think that maybe you're doing the wrong thing and spending all your time doing all the wrong stuff, because it's probably true. You know, even if you're um, completely secure in your position, there's probably something more efficient that you could be doing mm -hmm. that'd be more tailored to you. And it's all about finding that balance of, like, you know not doing exactly what you want to be doing the way you want to do it but also like compromising and not compromising and you know being aware of what your your actual values are you know not not art values not like what art is, is better but it's like what do you want for your life like do you want to make tons of money do you want a family do you want free time do you want all these other things and identifying like what is your ideal success case you know like best case scenario um do you earn a lot of money or do you have a family and free time you know and both in the same going back to the piano mentality or analogy um both decisions are correct for different people you know and sometimes people have to walk down that path in order to like figure out that they don't actually really want to be rich or they really don't want a family um, I guess it's the whole, like, you don't know unless you try. Yeah, definitely. And, which is scary. It's like, you're probably wrong, you know? It's like, you're probably an idiot, and you're probably wasting your time. And moving forward in spite of that is really scary. You know? <laughs> and um, I know for a fact that I'm going to say things on this podcast again that I'm going to regret, and things that I'm going to be embarrassed by. And it's more of just like a... I'm... I know everyone else is an idiot and I know I'm an idiot. So it's like embracing the fact that I know nothing. No one else knows anything. No one knows like, um, anything about anyone else. And it's just always assumptions and, um, and believing that and also just trying my best is like, I think a recipe for success. So. I think that's one thing about like, going to art conventions yeah. that is useful to have like everybody's just like failing and trying in their own ways yeah, yeah even the critiquers yeah even the portfolio because they're like i mean you could be doing portfolio reviews now and you would be like oh, did i do that one right or am i <laughs> am i am i am i supposed to be here am i mm -hmm. good enough to do this or do i even want to be an artist or like do i even want to work in games and um, and the thing I found is it's, it's like the anxiety doesn't go away. It's how you respond to it. Cause like, even the people that I know that are again, extremely wealthy, they're like, I don't know if I made the right decision, you know, mm -hmm. and if you're looking to feel secure in yourself, you should be thinking differently because, um, the, I like, I'm secure in my insecurity, you know, 
And I know that it's not going to go away. And it's more about embracing that as an aspect of my personality and who I am rather than trying to fight it and run away from it. You know, it's like, um, apologizing for like saying stuff that is wrong. Like I'm already doing it, you know, it's like, okay, it's part of who I am, you know, <laughs> it's like, I'm sorry if I, you know, I'm saying dumb stuff, but, um, and that's like, uh, not being embarrassed by it, just being, knowing that, uh, it's, it's the best I can manage. I think those flaws too are what people love, yeah. you know, like I've heard people say that there's something endearing about like, a young artist who comes up to them asking for a portfolio review who is yeah. very shy and very like scared because like, you're going up to somebody and getting you your work looked at. Yeah. And at the risk of them saying that you're not very good. Um, yeah, definitely. And, um, I mean, I have been thinking a lot about this idea where it's like somebody who wants to be a runner that goes out and runs for a tenth of a mile. I actually respect more in some ways than the person that runs a marathon every day, you know, and doesn't really struggle with it. It's like, mm -hmm. it's actually harder for that person relatively to run 0.1 miles and to run 26 miles a day, you know? And it's like, um, it doesn't matter how far along you are in the process. It's matter, it matters like how you see yourself, and, you know, and like, the thing I'm realizing is that people, if they have the right mindset, will get there and they will be successful no matter where they start. It's just a matter of like maintaining the, the humility and the gratitude to keep going in the way that is proper. That's a big one. And that applies to like all aspects. You know, if you're humble enough, then you know that you're not, you're not the, you're not the, um, the one who knows everything. Yeah. yeah. And you know, applying it to art and um, jobs. Like I've had people who were, you know, big names in the industry tell me that they would much rather work with somebody who was less good, but was good to work with. Well, I, but like less, less of a good artist, like less of a good technical Technical, draftsman, but they're actually better at communicating their ideas fundamentally than that artist. Like they're actually a better artist. You know, if art is about communication, they're better at communicating their ideas just because they're easier to talk to than the person who's like a better artist. You know? Yeah. And, and a lot of what concept art is, is learning those technical skills so that you can apply them to telling the story. And, yeah. um, I had an artist tell me recently that, um, he has foregone a lot of the technical skill in his work because he works as a concept artist. Yeah. Um, he has foregone a lot of like, I mean, he still has like that, that technical like training, yeah. but the most important thing now isn't to make a pretty picture. It's to make a picture that explains something. Yeah. Well, and I think that's like something that a lot of people lose sight of is the concept art is not the final product of what you're doing. The final product is the idea, you mm -hmm. know, and then the idea that serves, you know, and I think a lot of people get caught up in concept art being this like end result kind of thing. And it's only one step along a long process of getting like a 3D asset made or something. Mm -hmm. And an animation made to like, you know, be on the screen for five seconds while somebody looks at it and enjoys it, you know. Um, right. I mean, that's why people can love, still love old games. Yeah. You know, even though they may not necessarily think that the art is updated to what like when like crisis was the big thing, you know, yeah. like that was the, the amazing visual game or whatever. Right. But that didn't stop people from loving like Mario. Yeah. Mario. Yeah. Like super Mario or, um, like Pong. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, it's, it's because those games have more to offer than just like the technical visual beauty. Yeah. Which, I mean, there's still something, visually appealing about simple shapes running around on the screen but um and that's why like i do think that um your success as an artist or as a concept artist isn't always about your technical skill but it is your yeah. ability to convey information yeah well and i mean some of the most famous concept artists are actually um bad technical artists mm -hmm. like george lucas can be considered a concept artist because he actually designed darth vader and you know all of Star Wars pretty much hmm. and it's like um, 
like concept art is way more about the idea and that not it's never about how good the drawing is yeah yeah but like when you're working on it i mean like at work you know i still feel like i want to push myself to do better i want to push myself to be yeah oh it's uh we've been recording for like three hours oh my god okay <laughs> are we still going are we still recording yeah yeah I feel like I've been like leaning out the whole time as if I like I have one foot out the door, but yeah. it's just so hot and Toasty. we have a breeze here. Sketchy Van Podcast. The best podcast, in the, the number one podcast in the world. Well, for me, um, it being uncomfortable is actually part of the presentation. The experience, of it. yeah. Yeah. Like what people see is like. I don't know, when I watch the other ones, are, is it still rolling? Yeah. Yeah, when I watch the other ones, um, you know, like I was focused on the, the content and what people were saying, but like what you don't see on the other end of the camera or like, you know, when you're sitting at home by yourself, like watching on the computer, you don't see like the heat and the flies and oh, you yeah. don't smell it. Like, right. and that's, and that's part of the experience. like. The van smells like a van, you know, it smells like camping. It smells like... Oh yeah, for sure. Like not in a bad way, but like that's part of the experience. And I wish that's something that you could package up and like well, I, show to people. I also feel like it humanizes people too. It's like you're a concept artist working in video games at a big company. And people might think that you're like beyond like being uncomfortable or something or sweating. And it's like we're in this uncomfortable thing being eaten by mosquitoes. And it's like, that's just, you know, no matter who you are, you're going to be attacked by mosquitoes you know <laughs> that's why i like the podcast so much is like you well, get i appreciate it thank you yeah you get to see people in there as humans yeah yeah that's kind of the goal not as like art gods which you know everybody has that religious experience with when like instagram using their yeah yeah like you follow people that you value and stuff and that's totally understandable follow the church of kim jong-gi or proko or <laughs> uh brainstorm or art center or scott robertson it's like Marshall Vandreth and it's like a, again very much a religious experience but um, would you like to uh, close out and yeah we've been going for I don't know how much you're going to edit but we've been going for like three hours I think probably close to two and a half oh so. okay two and a half all I know is this was a really fun experience yeah thanks for doing this with me and I'm really, really grateful that you drove all the way out and that I was on, you know, part of your trip and your journey, and I get to share this with you. I think you're number seven. Wow. Yeah. I'm the seventh podcast? Lucky number seven. Nice. <laughs> well, thank you for being on. I really appreciate it. Uh, how should people follow you on Instagram oh, or um, website? or? Christina Cornette Art. No. Is that my Instagram? You could look it up. Oh, geez. I don't even know. I'll, I'll tag it. Do you want to do the point thing? Oh, where do we point? Just down, right? Like like where this marshmallow bag is? Yeah, I'm going to put it over the marshmallow bag. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. my Instagram. Yeah. Whatever that is that you see there. Um, I also have an art station. But yeah, there's, a lot of, a lot of, there's a lot of old stuff in it. And so if you're interested in seeing old portfolios and what I was hired with, um, my art station has a lot of yeah a lot of that stuff cool sweet thank you thank you nice yay